you so much for uh, being here, everybody. Uh, taking time out of your busy schedules. Some of you are at night, some, some during the day, uh, depending on where you are in the world. So thank you. Thank you so much for making that effort. Uh, the topic tonight, tonight is uh, Inspire. So teaching young learners online. What a challenge. What a difficult year it's been. Um, I started with a, I was thinking of a motif or some kind of a theme for today's presentation. And I was thinking about the first thing, one of the first things we learned, which is the alphabet. So A, B, C, D, right? So when we're teaching English, we always start with the alphabet. So if that's the case with the alphabet, then what exactly, what exactly do we do? We teach a basic form, but then students go out into the world and they see A written in so many different ways. It's really a bit of a challenge, but it shows that we do some basic training in the classroom, but the students also complement what they learn by continuing to learn outside. And I think making those lifelong learners is something that we really, really need to be able to do. So we're going to be focusing on ideas around that. So education, we say, is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. This is something that the poet William Butler Yeats wrote. Uh, I love this idea. We're not there. We're not there just to get students, you know, to take all of the knowledge that we know and say, okay, open your head. I'm going to pour in all these ideas and then you'll be smart. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that at all. What we're really doing is we're trying to inspire them so that they will be, first of all, learning in our classrooms, but continuing to learn. So what exactly is inspiring? Why is this inspiring learners so important? And how do we inspire young learners? That's a couple of the questions that I'm going to try to answer uh, in this session. And, uh, and I hope you, I hope you have your, can bring your own ideas as well as questions at the end. So inspiration, I would say, sets the path to success. We start with that inspiration, that idea, that excitement about learning, and that leads into motivation. So the inspiration is a general idea. We maybe see somebody else speaking another language. Remember the first time you saw someone speaking another language you didn't understand? For me, for me, the first time was my own mother. My mother was born in Norway, and she never spoke Norwegian at home. But then one day, her um, uh, my grandmother came to visit, and they were speaking in, in Norwegian. And I thought, this is a woman I've known for my whole life, maybe only five years, but but I, I don't remember her ever speaking in, Nor in this other language. She was speaking, but I couldn't understand her. That was an inspiration for me about learning languages. So that inspiration leads to motivation. And from motivation in the classroom, we start seeing that progress, uh, trying to achieve goals. And then finally, success. But that success is never finished. We all continue to learn language throughout our lives. I myself, I consider myself a language learner. I'm still learning English. Of course, I'm a native English speaker, but I still learn new vocabulary. I look at new genres. There's new things for me to learn all all the time, as I think for everyone. So one of the things we need to do is to learn how to learn. And that begins with that motivation. But this past year has made it difficult. And I think you all know why. Uh, it's uh, the COVID virus and being at home and classes being disrupted in so many ways uh, has made progress slow for a lot of language learners. Uh, teachers throughout have been heroes. And like you today, like everyone who's come today, taken an hour of their time and said, okay, I'm gonna try to learn something else. I know you're already trained teachers. You already know how to do this, but you're still looking for new ways to teach. And that's fantastic. That's the greatest thing about teaching and learning. Around the world, teachers have found many ways to adapt to the needs of their students. Now, this is an example here. You see the uh, woman, the teacher in the truck and um, with the table and the seats for her student. And uh, what happened is she's in Mexico. And when COVID started, uh, her students were spread around. Not only were they spread around, but they did not have, they did not have any, uh, any uh, opportunities to catch a, a bus to come to her. And they also, they didn't have computers at home. So she decided, okay, I'll throw a table in my truck and I'll go see them. 
So every day she drives for two hours to visit each of her students and give them their lessons and, and check their homework and do everything else. A great teacher. We found a lot of other ways of adapting to COVID and the biggest one has been this social distancing, separating students to try to keep them healthy. And you can see these ones are also wearing masks and then the face shields as well. Uh, it's been challenging, but people have done it in creative ways. And here's a couple of examples from elementary or primary school classrooms. I love the book boats <laughs> or the book boats with made out of old shipping containers of some kind. And it's obviously just a, play, a way to keep the students in a certain place. And it's fun. It's fun, right? So the teacher in the other picture uh, has created her own sort of uh, teaching center and, and, and created her own social distancing. We also see a lot of creative and fun social distancing. This is a picture from China. And what's the purpose? Why, why is the little girl wearing wings? Well, she's wearing the wings, of course, to remind her that, you know, you can't get too close. And if you do get too close to another student, you start banging into them. I think I would love to see the students in this, in, in this classroom on a playground all banging into each other. It would be very funny, but I'm sure they would keep their social distance. It's creative. It's a creative idea. And again, teachers have come up this past year with so many creative and uh, creative creative ideas and ideas that use critical thinking for all sorts of processes in the classroom. Another one we've seen that has been happening is uh, outdoor classrooms. This is a school very near where I live and uh, they just really wanted to get the students outside. So they built this outdoor classroom with, uh, with the uh, seats and desks basically just to give the students some fresh air. And uh, uh, parents of course can get involved in different ways as well. This is actually just down the alley from where I live very close to my house, and someone took some, had some old frames. You, people were throwing out pictures or something, and they used blackboard paint, so they painted the black, and then they put also some crayons, uh, some crayons out there for any children to sort of come by and do it. And I go by there quite often, uh, and, uh, and I see that it's always new. New children are doing new drawings and things. Uh, they're being, parents here, in this case, are being part of the solution and taking a response responsibility for educating the neighborhood. There's an old African proverb. It says, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. And this is an example of some of the villagers or people in this city taking the opportunity to educate other children, or at least give them some opportunities for creativity. But, but, but in many cases, students have not had the opportunities to meet with teachers and other students face-to-face. -face. Schools have been closed. In, in, in the city where I live, Montreal, schools have been closed on and off throughout the entire year. They start letting students come back to school, and then there's a bigger outbreak, and then they say, no, 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 you have to go home again. So it's been, it's been very, very challenging. And for friends who have children, uh, young children in particular, it's been a really, really difficult year. Uh, it's been very difficult for many students who have had to learn online. And you may have seen this heartbreaking, heartbreaking photo of a child, uh, Ezra, his, his name, Ezra Coombs, and his mother took this photo on his first day of kindergarten, his first day of kindergarten, and he became so frustrated, he was crying. Why? Probably things using the computer, not getting the attention, not being able to ask a question or not understanding, but how sad, how sad. Think back to your first day of kindergarten. I remember mine so many years later. How exciting, new friends running around, new, new environment, exciting, colorful kindergarten class, uh, but not for Ezra. So. So it's, it's been very, very challenging for many people. But despite this, teaching online is here to stay. Many people have thought, okay, well, this will be over soon. This will be over soon or something. And then we'll, things will get back to normal. No, things are never going back to normal. They are never going to be exactly the way they were before. It's been a struggle, but teachers have found many innovate, innovative ways of, uh, to make online learning work. And among these, finding ways to inspire and motivate students uh, are among the most important things that we do. 
there have been challenges. There have been challenges. And one of the biggest challenges has simply been getting students online. I see we have some uh, teachers today from Peru. I gave a talk uh, a month or so ago uh, on blended learning. To, um, and, and I was talking, I think, to university students. But the, uh, I got an email afterwards from one uh, teacher uh, from, uh, who lives outside of Cusco, Peru. And he said, my students don't even have electricity. <laughs> Some of my students don't even have electricity in their homes. How can they continue their educations? So we had a couple of emails and went through some different solutions, but he's much closer to like using the truck, like the woman that I showed you before. So it's been very, very challenging getting students online. There are some solutions for one, many, many public places have Wi-Fi. So if you don't have Wi-Fi at home, maybe there's a coffee shop or you can stand next to a bank or a grocery store and ask those places if they could make their Wi-Fi public. Put a little sign out for students to use the Wi-Fi. I've seen it happen here in Montreal. Many people have tried to do that to make it easier. Other challenges are simply with the keyboard, the technology. So we say that, you know, today <laughs> the children are born holding a mobile phone in their hands. They're already used to the technology and they are digital natives, but very young children and quite often they don't have, for example, keyboarding skills. They can't, they don't know how to type. How confusing, how confusing the keyboard. Why isn't it in alphabetical order, A, B, C, D? Instead, it's, it's Q, W, E, R, T. It doesn't make sense for young children, right? They don't see it. So that's been a challenge. Not all students have equal access to especially not just Wi-Fi, but also quality computers. So difficult, what do you do? If if a student doesn't have a computer at home that they can use to take lessons, does that student just not take any do classes? Well, in, in uh, many places where I've talked to, uh, teachers have been really, really pushed the schools and said, I know you have computers in the school, give them to the students. I want to send those home. So they check in with their students. They find out who has a computer, who doesn't have a computer. For the ones that they don't say, okay, you're gonna to have to take perfect care of it, but we're going to take a computer from the school if the school is closed and put it in your home. So people, again, teachers have found these solutions because they don't start with, oh, what's the cost or what's the problems or what's the difficulty. Teachers start with, one idea. Teachers start with one idea of, uh, of simply asking, what is best for my students? And if you start from that question, you always find the best answers. Some young learners have mobile phones. Uh, again, mobile phones are fantastic. And they've, in many cases, they've allowed access uh, to classes. Uh, but phones are also tools for collecting and producing information. I'll give you some ideas about this later, later about how students can take photographs or collect sound or, or take photograph or take video. Also, so many things they can do. But while phones are better, uh, better than nothing, Thing for watching a lesson, they're more difficult to sort of type on a phone or to answer or participate with other students. Maybe some of you are working on your phone right now, could be, but it is a bit of a challenge in many cases. Another big challenge that we face is students can just simply feel unconnected. Uh, traditional school classrooms give students a sense of being. They connect. They connect to a place. They connect with a sense of community. They make friends. And many of you, just like me, we made our best friends when we were at school. Uh, you share, you bond, you, you, you go through good times and bad times together. And it's so great. Uh, but online, it's more difficult to make those connections uh, because you have the class, then the class is over and your friends are gone. You're, you don't have that time in the hallway or the playground or anything else. So online learning can lack a connectedness among students. Teachers need to find ways to make the online classroom much more personal, much more personal. So again, students do feel more connected and can share ideas. Uh, what about textbooks? What about textbooks and all of this? This has been a really interesting question and I put this in because I've been asked over and over and over again, say, well, do students still need textbooks? Because, you know, we're teaching online and maybe we have some online resources. We could just give them YouTube videos to watch or something. And the answer is really that textbooks have a key role in online learning. 
You can look up the literature, you can look up the, you know, what's been the research that's been done on this. But just as one example, uh, uh, Petrone in 2020, and I have these references at the end of the presentation, he says that uh, students benefit from having a physical resource that they can refer to on their own time and at their own pace. So that's what a book does, on your own time, at your own pace. In many cases, a teacher will give a lesson, but not record it. So even if the student wanted to go back to it, they would have to zoom back and forth, they would have to download the recording, it's too complicated. The textbook plays a key role in many ways, and we'll show you some of the ways in a moment. Textbooks also benefit parents a lot. We are always focusing on the students, but of course, if we're talking about primary, young students, young learners, it's the parents who are often, you know, become the surrogate or the, uh, the secondary sort of teacher helping out there. So these textbooks benefit parents of young learners, uh, especially the ones who can't always sit with their child during lessons. Now, it's, it's for many families, it's been a bit of a nightmare. They've got, you know, they've got two or three children at home and the parents are both working from home. They all want to use the computers at the same time. It can be very, very challenging and difficult. But having the book, having the book gives them a kind of a reference guide uh, for what the student, what their child should be learning and when. Right? I know you're counting the children here. <laughs> I did that for you. There's 11 kids in this family. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I have two. Okay. What about note taking? This is another aspect and, uh, and a, big, a big issue because in many cases, the teachers are not tracking are the students taking notes. Now, in a classroom, of course, you can very easily see everyone and you can say, oh, you know, take open your books. Why aren't you taking, taking some notes on this? Um, uh, there's so much research that's saying that uh, it's better done by hand than on screen. So I know, I know many students uh, at the university level in particular, they just record a lesson or they keep the video and they say, why take notes? I've got the whole video. But there's something else that goes on when you take notes. And I don't care if you're a primary school student or a university student. It's the same thing. When you take notes, you use critical thinking to sort and to summarize ideas. So the person is talking for five minutes, you can't write down everything that they say. So you have to listen and say, well, what is he saying? What are the most important things? Okay, I'm going to write those things down and organize it. And then you have notes you can go back to and expand on. And that's the way we really learn. We don't learn just by playing the video a second time. Writing by hand also helps in other ways. And again, there's lots of research on this. Uh, Gentry 2016 says that handwriting makes better writers and spellers and predicts reading and academic success. So students who, who write by hand a lot more than just rather than just typing, they will be better students and, and they will improve their writing and all of, also their spelling. Spelling, how embarrassing, how embarrassing for myself, for myself. Really, I, I you know, I type, the computer says, oh, is that the wrong word? It does the spell check automatically. It fills in the word before I finish typing. Same with children. They're not really thinking about the spelling because the computer is helping them so much. They finish writing a paragraph or something, then they do spell check, it corrects it all. But it doesn't say at the end, it doesn't say, these are the mistakes you made, these are the problems, you should work on this. It's not giving them any feedback. So again, the handwriting is quite important. So we're talking about online learning, but really there's different kinds of online learning. We should differentiate these. First of all, online learning we can say is just online and it has no face-to-face -face opportunities. If you want face-to-face, -face, that's blended learning. Usually there's some online, some online, and some face-to-face. -face. So in many, in many countries they've said, well, we don't want so many students coming to class. So if there were 30 students in a class, we'll just have 15 come today, 15 come tomorrow. And so they split them up and the ones who aren't there uh, all of them can maybe take some online classes, uh, whatever. 
And then hybrid learning is when you have some students in the classroom, but also some students are online at the same time. And so the teachers actually, this is very challenging. The teacher has to teach in two ways to the class that's in front of them, but also, also they have to talk to thinking about, okay, what are the ones at home doing? Because if, if in the classroom you say, okay, everyone work in pairs, then in the online classroom, you have to say, okay, I will put you into breakout rooms, you know, Zoom breakout rooms, and you can be in pairs there. So it's very, very compli complicated. But there's different versions of online teaching and learning. So what's the future? What is the future? As I already said, online here learning is here to stay, here to stay. And it, it is here to stay for many good reasons. Um, my, uh, my youngest son is in second year university. He loves it. He loves it. What does he love about it? He loves the fact that he has a class at 8.30 and it's videotaped. And so he can sleep in, right? <laughs> He's that age. He loves to sleep in. So he can sleep in and watch it at 11.30. He can watch it again. He can zoom to the part he doesn't understand. He can copy that part, send it to his teaching assistant, say, I don't get this, you know. So for him, there's a lot of advantages. And um, so I think we're going to see it continue in different ways. And uh, eventually, teachers who can teach online will replace those who cannot or who are unwilling to do so. Um, here's an example. Here's an example and a very funny one. Um, just last month, just last month, June 28th, um, Hong Kong had a black rain. You know, black rain warning is when it's really, really heavy war rain. And these are photographs from that day that I, that I got from the newspaper. A friend of mine in Hong Kong, because I lived in Hong Kong for 12 years, uh, um, a friend of mine wrote to me, he said, no physical school for Joshua, uh, that's his young son, but since they invented online learning, the kids are still being rounded up in cyberspace. <laughs> it means that even though, you know, school would normally be cancelled because of a black rain, because they said, oh, well, we can go online. We know how to do that. Then, of course, there was no holiday for the children, right? I thought, oh, how sad. Canadian, I'm Canadian. So, of course, when I was a child, it was snow days. In the winter, if it snowed too much, we didn't have to go to school. Oh, we were so excited about that. But this is changing. So you can see that uh, interruptions to schools are just not going to be the same. So what's the question? A question is traditional versus online classes, which is better? Well, you can't really ask this anymore. What we really have to say are what are the best practices of the traditional classroom? What do traditional classrooms do really, really well? And then how can we offer, how can we offer those best practices in online classrooms? So we have to think about many different things here. Um, one of the biggest things that we do in a traditional classrooms is we engage young learners. We really, really bring them, uh, uh, bring them close to us and make them think that they're, you know, really focused on their learning. Young learners are usually highly motivated anyway, as long as they respect and trust their teachers. They approach learning with curiosity. So it's just natural for young children. They, they have a greater sense of curiosity. For young learners, language learning can be like solving a puzzle or learning a secret language. They love that. They love that opportunity to sort of do something that maybe someone else can't. Um, motivations. Uh, motivations that these children have are a combination of extrinsic and intrinsic. What do those words mean? Extrinsic means outside the student. That's when your parents are pressuring you or your peers are pressuring you or the marks. You think those are really important. Really, extrinsic learning is kind of a teenage thing that's much more important at that age. Uh, but very young children and adults, they're both much more intrinsic. They're learning because they find it interesting or, or, or amazing or exciting. And uh, their friends are doing it as well. And that's a little bit extrinsic, but they just get excited about it. What we want to do is to shift to much more uh, intrinsic learning. Sorry, I'm getting a couple of uh, raised hands from uh, Patricia and others. I can't answer those and get through everything in time. So please just save your questions to the ends and your comments. Students need a combination of both extrinsic, extrinsic and intrinsic motivations. What about assessments? We're going to talk about that a bit. 
Traditional assessments tend to be individual, high stress, and teacher controlled. Multiple choice exams are popular because they're easy to mark rather than the best way to measure ability. Um, so we give a lot of multiple choice questions, but really, when's the last time someone really asked you a multiple choice question? Does somebody stop you on the street and say, oh, excuse me, I'm hungry. Could you tell me where there's A, a library, B, a swimming pool, C, a cafeteria? Nobody does that, right? Nobody talks to you like that in multiple choice questions. Yet we have so many of them in our, in our classes. Why? Who likes to take a test? Um, think about your own studies. How often did a test perfectly measure your achievement in a subject? Much more likely, many times you walked away from a test and you said, I didn't study for that, or I didn't know that would be on the test. Um, how often did you study for a test? pass and then forget the content soon after. What if I gave each of you a math test right now <laughs> for all the math you learned when you were in grade seven or something? Uh, it would be very difficult, I know, for many, many of us, me included, right? Instead, we need to really to focus uh, on, on something else. And I'd say that's show what you know, getting students really to show what they know. Teachers have many reasons for assessing, but students need to show what they know. Questions should not be tricky uh, or purposely meant to confuse. They really should be uh, giving the students a chance to prove themselves. Why do we assess? Why do we assess? Oh, that's a big question. Actually, there's two main reasons, two main reasons. We have formative assessment, and that lets students understand their progress and what they need to study. So what do you mean have formative assessment? Well, just imagine you give them a test. At the end of the test, you say, okay, I'm not marking it. Here's the answers. I want you to go through and figure out how well would you do? And based on your answers, what do you have to study? What did you miss? What should you be studying more, right? And it gives them the idea. Summative assessment is just lets the teachers decide on whether the students are ready for the next level. We tend to give too many summative uh, tests, but that's really deciding, you know, can the students graduate? Can they go to the next level? Uh, can they go to the next class? You know, something like that. But, uh, but really, we should be giving much more formative assessment to let students know how well they're doing. So, so, you know, just put down your red pen sometimes and give students more answers and a chance to see what they're doing and see what they have to learn themselves. This helps to shift responsibility, not just like learning English is not your responsibility. Learning English is their responsibility. They have to take charge. So how do we measure language acquisition? Well, you know, through multiple choice tests and things, not really, not really. We test all sorts of things, reading, writing, listening, speaking, pronunciation, spelling, grammar, rhetorical structures, formality. The older you get, the more, the longer the list is. But really, we really only want to test one thing. And uh, how we should measure language acquisition is, can a student communicate? Can a student communicate in reading, uh, sorry, in writing? Can a, a student communicate in speaking? Those are the reasons we learn a language, to communicate. And that, that communication also means listening, also means uh, reading. Uh, what others, what other people are, are, have to offer. So this idea of communication, we have to kind of rethink and think it's not, the test is not important. Uh, finishing page 72 in the book is not important. What's important is can the students communicate better at the end of the class than when they came in? So this idea of showing what you know, so you can ask yourself and the students can ask themselves, you know, who will you talk to? You know, what will you say? When will you use English? Where will you use English? Why will you choose one way of asking a question or saying something over another way of saying it? How will you get your message across? Will you be persuasive? Will you, you know, use emotion? Will you use hand gestures? How you do use a lot of those. <clears throat> These are all important, right? Okay, let's continue. So the idea of showing what you know. Here's a good trick, a very, very simple way to let students show what they know. 
is one of my graduate students. I teach students. I teach graduate students and doctoral students. They're all teachers. Uh, so one of my one of my uh, students who's a teacher does this. It's fantastic. He records every student in his class answering three questions, and uh, they can just you know they're level uh, appropriate, whatever is a level appropriate. At the end of the semester, he repeats the task, recording the students again. So, and then when the parents come at the end of the year, and also for the students themselves, he plays both recordings together. He says, this is how you were at the beginning of the semester or the beginning of the year, and here's what you can say now. And it's just, it really, really is motivating and inspiring because the students can see their progress so they can show what they know very, very visibly. Uh, what do students, why do students hate assessments and what can we do about it? You've probably seen this photo before. It's from India and it's actually not just, these are not students cheating. These are parents of students cheating. They're climbing the side of a testing building, uh, a building where the students are being tested and, and, uh, and they're trying to give the answers to their uh, kids who are in the classrooms. Completely wrong, completely wrong and, uh, you know, completely illegal, terrible, terrible thing to be doing. But really, when I look at this, I think, you know, I don't think, oh, that's crazy. I think, you know, man, those tests must be so important, so important. And, you know, the test is actually much more important than what the students are learning, because the test is a gateway to doing something else. So what's the alternative? What's the alternative to this kind of high stakes testing? Well, again, probably it's much more individualized and project based assessment on a common theme, let students collaborate rather, rather than compete. What do, you, what do you mean a common theme? Okay. Well, say you're going to give an, uh, an assignment to a class, say, oh, this week we're learning about food uh, or whatever it is, whatever your topic is. Say, okay, everyone, I want you to report on uh, a typical meal, but I want each of you to choose a different country. And one student will say, oh, teacher, what if we choose the same country? not my problem, right? Talk to each other. Everybody choose a different country. Share them. Make sure you're all doing a different country. So they all start running around and getting different ideas. And uh, what happens here? We've changed it from a competitive task to a collaborative task where they will share their ideas. And I don't care if they share their ideas because they're peer teaching, they're helping each other learn, right, by doing this. So you see, it's, there's, there's ways in which we can assess students which actually encourage learning, not just test what we talked about last week or something. Okay, make assessments into learning opportunities so that they can learn much more than just the assessment itself. So for example, Make tests per personal and project-based rather than just memory exercises. Ask for media-based projects. Um, and students can use their phones if they've got access to the phones or their parents' phones to take photos, to take video and sound recordings. Encourage collaboration. So, for example, if you say, give a, give a, a thing, say you're doing the family tree, right? Every primary school textbook always begins with, the, you know, always has the family tree in one of the first few units. Um, you say, you know, make, take photos and uh, introduce your family in English, right? And so they could do that as a sound recording or a little video or even just take some photos and then bring it back to the class. So it's something op more open-ended, but it's much more personal. It's personal because it's about their family. It's not about everybody else's family or some or the family with 11 kids that I showed you earlier, right? So it's more realistic. Because it's personal, it's more memorable. They will remember it much better because they've related the task to their own situation. Uh, here's another trick. Here's another trick, uh, something I use. Um, I never write tests. Uh, when, if I have to write a test, I get my students to do it. What? How can you do that? Uh, what I do is I ask my students, I say, everyone, I, you know, I've got 15 students in my class, everyone write 10 questions on the, uh, on the course. And uh, we're going to put it in the final exam. I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose just 20 questions out of all of those. And they said, oh, but, 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 you know, what if we ask the same question? <laughs> I said, don't do that. Tell everybody your questions and the answers and discuss them. And the students work so hard. So they go through all of my lectures for the course. They go through all the textbook. They do all the readings. And, and then they, they look at everything. Is this a good question? Is that a good question? 
they talk about everything. Other professors say to me, they say, but Ken, Ken, you know, you know, don't they know the answers then? I said, exactly. That's what you want. That's what I want at the end of the course is for them to know the answers at the end. So getting the students to write some of your tests is really a good way to make them work harder and uh, focus much more on the materials and saves you time. All right. All right. So that's lots of the challenges, a lot of the problems that we face and, and a few different ideas that you can use. I want to get much more uh, particular and I want to use a couple examples of, uh, of, uh, from textbooks. And I'm going to just as, as examples today, I'm going to be using these two, um, the workbooks and the student books from Smart English and from the second edition of My First Writing. These are, these are just examples to try to give you, uh, and I'm using Using them to give you general ideas. If you're using some other books, either by eFuture or anyone else, it's, it still will work, many of these things. But it's just trying to give you some concrete, realistic background of how you can use a textbook. And remember, your students are often online. They need more support, not less support. So the textbook helps to uh, do that. So the first one, the first one is we can always add layers to tasks. What does this mean to add layers? Well, some students are more able and some students are less able. This is true in every classroom that we ever have. Some students are a little bit better and some students are a little bit uh, more challenged. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, for the more able students, you can create additional layers of tasks and to make them much more challenging. Of course, you can always put the more able students together with the less able students as well. That's an important thing to do. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so you've got this, uh, uh, but what do we mean by creating additional layers to make them more challenging? Well, let's look at this for an, as an example. Look, uh, okay, so here we, have a, here we have a topic, and you can see it's D, listen and play, and then what do they have to do? They have to find and circle and ask and answer. These are the two types of tasks. What is it? It's a crayon. So it's obvious a task they can do with other students, right? So they can, you know, ask each other's questions and then they can find all the things and all they're all listed at the bottom by this point in the book the students have already learned you know the the different words for books and backpacks and crayons and uh, pens so they have this vocabulary already but you know I tell you I could use this one page for a month and teach lessons on it why because it's a very rich visual and there's a lot of things going on in this in this that uh, that we can really sort of explore in different ways. So, first of all, I could say, well, let's put the words in alphabetical order. And which words? Well, there's lots of words that are there. Um, but there's also, we, we can say, the students always have a little bit of extra information when they come into a class. Not everybody, not everybody has the same ideas, but a lot of them will know some things. So you look at this little squirrel character we've got here and you could label extra things in the picture. So we can see there's a squirrel or a chipmunk maybe. Yeah, the squirrel has a nut and uh, that nut is called an acorn. That's much more specific. But look at all the other vocabulary in this, in this uh, illustration. There's a little house, there seems to be a mailbox, there's uh, fruit, bananas, there's juices, uh, so many different things going on. Um, why not get students using some of that and talking about, talk about the bird? And you can see, of course, there's many hidden objects there, the, you know, the things, and so that makes it a lot more fun for students as well. So we've got all these different ideas going on. You know, how, how can we get students using them? Uh, just there's extra work. And what happens here is something really wonderful is if you do those sorts of things once or twice or three times with the students, they will start doing it themselves. They will start saying, oh, what else do I know is in this picture, right? So, of course, they have to find the hidden objects, you know, like, like the crayon. You can see that and the backpacks that look like a mailbox and things like that. But, but they're also going to start, you know, looking and saying, oh, what other words do I know here? And that's when students are starting to learn on their own. And it's a wonderful thing. But you train them to do that and you don't have to tell them. 
You don't have to tell them to do it. They will just start doing it naturally on themselves and extending their own learning. So again, there's a thousand questions that I could ask. I say, what color are their hairs? I could go through all the colors of different things. I could go through different textures. Some things are pointy, some things are curly. Uh, you know, basically different ideas that they've already learned. And so I'm recycling them and re, you know, emphasizing them. But in other cases, you know, things they don't. Where, you know, how many girls are there? How many boys are there? There's so many questions that we can ask. So create those new layers and give those to especially the more able students, but everybody will enjoy those. A second idea, second idea, 14 ideas, right? So a second idea is to involve family in some way. So a common complaint that I get is, you know, when I talk to teachers in different countries around the world, they say no one at home to no one at home to practice English. When the students go home, you know, the parents don't speak English, you know, so, uh, um, well, of course, students can always talk to each other and they can use the phone, they can use social media to practice with each other and that's good. But there's another, there's another uh, tricky thing that they can do and I love this idea. Teach grandma. <laughs> the best way to learn is to teach some, someone else, right? So ask young learners uh, to teach their siblings or their parents or their grandparents. And grandparents are the best ones. Why? They're very patient. You know, they love the attention of their grandchildren. So they say, okay, grandma, you know, I'm going to teach you to speak English. Say, okay. And say, okay, you say hello. Hello. No, 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 no. You say hello. And of course, children love to be teachers. So it's a great opportunity. And soon they will start practicing more and they have someone to practice with. And it's a marvelous, just a great shared experience for a grandchild and a grandparent. Always remember when we teach, we learn twice. You know, you learn twice as well. Okay, number three out of a 14. Learning is more memorable when it's tied to personal references. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'm repeating some things to try to get this idea across. So whenever you can learn something and you can think you can attach it to something in your own life, then that's fantastic. You know, you make it much more uh, memorable. You'll remember if it relates to you. Look for opportunities to reference students' names, their lives their interests, their culture, their favorite foods, anything you can. So here's an example from one of the books, and we've got so many things to work with here. Um, so what do we have? We've got the names of four characters. We've got uh, one, two, three, four pets, uh, different kinds. I mean, one of the pets is a duck, right? And uh, there's also a chicken in there. And then there's a song. It's saying smart English, smart English, uh, get your friends. It's time to start um, uh, English in your heart. So it, it's got a lot of things going on here, but there's substitutions that you you can make. So you can change the names of the song to your students' names. So instead of just using these four names, of course you do it the first time. You will go through all the, the names there because they're try you're trying to learn the characters. So, But after they've learned the characters and you're doing this revision, why not change it up, shake it up and let the students say, you know, say, who's, you know, who's going to be Jake? Okay, so you rename it. Maria, you know, or say, Maria, you can be Betty, you know, uh, Tomas, you can be Jake, something like that. So then you're changing, changing them all around. So it's kind of a fun thing. Do your students have pets? Do your students have pets? Change those names as well. So in any activity, and this is just one out of, you know, hundreds of activities in the book, you know, just think, you know, where could you bring it closer to the students' lives, again, to make it much more memorable? You can imagine, you can imagine one of these students going home. Mother says, oh, how was school today? Say, oh, it's okay. Oh, well, in English class, you know, I got to be in the song. And, you know, and also our dog, we, you know, Pee uh, Pee was in the, uh, is, was in the song too, right? So and they feel great about it. And it's much more memorable. Okay, number four, activate prior knowledge. So we used to assume that students came into a classroom with no prior knowledge. That's what I talked about at the very beginning with that quote, right? Remember, we, we were not a vessel to be filled. Uh, we're something, a fire to be uh, ignited. Uh, inspired. But uh, even the youngest students come to class knowing at least a few words of English. <clears throat> so we have to create learning opportunities from that. So this is similar to one of the first ones that I showed you, is finding out what else students know. 
So in an activity like this, there are opportunities to review colors, numbers, even the time on the clock, times, right? So, you know, what time is it? Mm, looks like it may be 2.30, uh, so almost 2.30, something like that. So the students always will come in knowing some extra words. You may not have taught it uh, yet, but the students will already know it. Uh, the, what's the dog wearing? The dog has a hat. Ah, oh, hat. Maybe the stu some students will know that word. Um, there's a ruler there. Have they learned the word ruler in English? Maybe not, but maybe just one student out of all of your students knows the word ruler because they learned it somewhere else. And uh, maybe someone has a yo-yo. I see a yo-yo under the be bed. That's probably the same in many different languages. So they would know that, which is also a great thing. Okay, so all those words that are similar between English and, and your own language. So what the group knows is important. What the group knows. It's important to find out what the group knows, not just an individual student, but what the whole group knows. This helps students realize what others know and, and they're proud of what they know. They have a chance to shine. Ah, I can show, you know, I knew the answer to this and other, other, other students didn't. And they feel special, they feel good, and they want to contribute more. And again, I guarantee students, if you start with this type of task, students will continue to look ahead in their books because they will think, oh, I wonder if she'll ask me, if the teacher will ask me about, you know, what's in this picture. And they want to be prepared ahead of time. So they're studying ahead. What is fantastic. Number five, develop some creative thinking. Creative thinking is essential to problem solving. For young learners, play is often a way of thinking creatively. They're always trying something new. So we want to look for some uh, creative questions and creative questions are open-ended. There's not just one answer. There could be different answers uh, for that question. It could be personal answers. So it's not important what the answer is. What's important is the thinking process. So you say, which bag do you like? Which bag? So there's two bags here or, or which pen do you like? And, uh, and the students say, oh, I like this one. Say, why do you like that one? This does a couple of interesting things. One is it makes the students realize if they don't have the language for it, they, uh, you know, they, under they will start to realize that they need more language and that's motivation for learning. So they might say, oh yes, I like the blue backpack, fine, no problem. <laughs> but if they like the other one, how do they describe that? They say, oh, it's very, very colorful. What should I say? They don't know. Number six, gamify activities. Actually, primary school classrooms are full of games, uh, but uh, games involve chance and competition and sometimes collaboration, working together to solve a problem. It's always better to play with teams rather than a, every student against every student. Why? Because, you know, there's some students, they think they're the weakest in the class and they know it. And so you ask a question and then they're like, oh, you know, they don't want to participate because they think someone else will know the answer or, but you put them together with a group of other students, it improves. So there's different games that you can play with any piece of text that you find in the cl classroom. One of them is just a simple repetition, uh, pen, bag, crayon, bag, pen, right? Okay. So what, what, what? Okay. So I'm going to say again, pen, bag, crayon, bag, bag, pen. Okay. You say it now. And then the students have to try to say it, right? It's a bag. It's a pen. It's a bag. It's a, you know, crayon. Uh, so these are different, just repetition uh, ones where the students have to listen very carefully and then repeat. Um, another big clue here or a trick here is let your students uh, lead the games. You don't always have to be in charge. Let your students do more of the teaching. Let them be in charge for a little bit. It's much more fun for them and a good exercise. Number seven, turn learners into teachers. Consider all of the roles of the teacher and decide which ones the students can do instead. I already told you that students can write some of your uh, essay questions or your, um, your test questions, right? Ask your most able and least able students to teach a lesson, a little part of it. Uh, you give students a chance to shine, give them some preparation. Of course, you don't want to do it on the day of a class, but before, you know, the day before you say, in tomorrow's class, I want you to draw a bag for the class. Please practice tonight, right? And then, so then that student practices it and inspires the other students because if one student can do it, they say, oh, if she can do it, I'm sure I can do it too. Turn learners into peer editors. Never be the first one to look at a student's work. Instead, always have students check each other's work. Give marks to the peer editors as well if you're going to collect them. 
ask parents to check in initial uh, students' homework, it's always good to just get that extra feedback from them. Peer editing uh, also requires, though, that we give clear instructions of what to look for, such as the correct answers, spelling, punctuation. Students are often unwilling to ask uh, for help uh, from the teacher, but they don't mind asking other students. So when they're doing something like this, you know, write the words in the sentence, we will ride to the park, we will go to the park. Ah, well, it could be either, but actually you see we will ride our bikes to the park is the is the right answer for ride so ah oh, so the other student can explain that and and exp and and give them help so that's an important thing number eight create study buddies very very simple especially online in class and especially online create study buddies who can act as peer teachers and peer editors what do these uh, what do these uh, study buddies do they make sure your study buddy finishes all the tasks including the homework so when there's homework you have to say, did you do it? No, well, I didn't finish it. I didn't understand. Oh, let me explain that, right? Answer questions. If they don't know, they can ask the teacher for help. This is a trick. This is a trick. Because if I don't understand, I don't want to go to the teacher. But if my friend doesn't understand, I can go to the teacher and say, sorry, my friend doesn't understand this part. Can you tell me? <laughs> it's much easier to ask, right? So help your buddy catch up if he's absent in the class as well. So if somebody's sick or they miss a class, then you, there's always one person say, okay, can you, Ming, can you help, you know, someone else, your study buddy catch up? I see she's not here today. Number nine, have students create media projects. We already talked about this. Using the mobile phones, digital photos, video, make sound recordings. Tie those media projects to textbook lessons though. So here's an example, great activity uh, where it's just grammar practice and, and good, but, uh, but you could make it much more exciting by adding to it. This weekend, take a photo or a short video of each verb you do. So maybe the students aren't going camping, but they may, you know, play, play soccer or football, um, you know, or run badminton or skip on a rope or do something else and all the all the words that are written there so again it makes them think about the lesson and what they're doing in the weekend and it's a fun activity in class ask students to share and explain what are you doing in this you know what are you doing in this photo class uh, what is she doing in the photo so then you go back it really creates a learning opportunity so it complements it complements what's in the textbook the textbook provides the textbook provides a template for what they should do 10 explore extra vocabulary everyone has personal vocabulary my interests my sports my hobbies my family my favorite foods my pets many things they're different to yours i like to bake i like i bake bread every week right so <laughs> i need the language for that when i when i go somewhere else help students write their autobiographies i have this many sisters i have three sisters and one brother i learned taekwondo and piano those are personal for you now the less the words may not all be in the lesson but again, Again, let the students try to learn some of those things and make it their job to find out the words for special things that they do. Number 11, explore grammar through parts of speech. These are the basic parts of speech. What does each one do? Why do we use each one? Once you've done that, you can explore and substitute different parts of speech. So we say, okay, well, what's going on with these words? Ah, these are verbs. Okay, so we've established that these are verbs. So what is another verb we could use in, in these uh, ones? So for the first one, ah, remember we just learned the word ride, ride? So we can say, we will ride to the library tomorrow. So they can start adding and using what they've already learned learned to build this up a bit more. Number 12, develop critical thinking. The future will be built by people who can think criti critically. Other jobs will increasingly be done by computers and robots. And this is just a picture from in front of my, uh, uh, on my street, and it's a perlator, and it follows this guy. He stops, it stops. He goes, it goes. And it's just for delivering packages, but yeah, robots. Why is, okay, so circle the mistake. In a one like this, a critical thinking one is just simply to ask the question, why is each one a mistake? So they can do the task, but after ask the critical thinking question. Number 13, let students create rules. So when you, learned, when you learned your first language, you never learned grammar. Your mother never sat down and say, okay, today we're going to learn about prepositional phrases. 
<laughs> it never happened, right? I guarantee it. Instead, you created rules in your head when you made mistakes, uh, uh, when you and someone laughed or corrected you or something. And, uh, you know, um, I remember my own son when he was very young, I said, Oh, Spencer, how was your day? Maybe three years old. He said, Oh, it was good. I swimmed with mummy. Right. So I said, oh, no, swim is, uh, is an irregular past tense verb. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, oh, you swam with mummy. And he said, yes, I swam with mummy. He never made the mistake again. But what's interesting is why did he say swimmed? Well, I didn't say swimmed. His mother didn't say swimmed. Uh, he said swimmed because walk, walked, talk, talked, swim, swimmed. He had created a rule for forming the past tense in his head but it wasn't the correct rule in this case, right? So students can create simple rules for English as they learn it. So what's the rule? What's the rule? So again, when you're giving them grammar practice and things, you can say, what's the rule? They won't get it perfectly. They won't always get the right answer, but they start some thinking about how grammar is formed and, and rules for other things as well. Okay, finally, expand ideas. Uh, introduce variables to encourage young learners to think outside the textbook, applying what they learn to their own lives. Encourage students to keep simple diaries using the language that they learn in class. Now, when I say a diary, I, just, I don't mean that every student, a primary student, has to write a page in English every night. But if they take one photograph every day and just write what it is, something like that, like on their phone, they don't have to print it out, but just some things like that. Variables are also things that they can apply directly to their textbooks. So in this one, what is it? Make an idea about your family's plans for this weekend, your weekend. So instead of the weekend, this week, this month, this year, instead of your family, my family, my friends, myself, work with other tenses, other activities. So again, just trying to more variables, expanding it. It creates something where the students realize that the, the book is a starting point for learning English. It's not you know, this is, this is a, uh, a, just a simple guide. If you memorize everything here, you'll be a perfect English speaker. It's not how it works. It's the starting point, And it's really going to help if you make them think about learning English on their own. Oh, that's a lot of information in a short time. And I talked for too long. What do we know? Young learners face many challenges, particularly in online classes. Students can get help from family members and from each other. The textbook is a starting point for helping to creatively personalize learning. Start with the textbook, but build on it. Assessment should show what students know. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I think we've got some time for questions now. Um, let's see how many we can fit in. All right, let me go back to my... Okay, so Gary's going to give us some questions, I think. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kambidi. Um, okay. So we do have a few questions in here. Um, let me try to pick a few out for you. Uh, let's see, the first one here, could you please tell me more about the differences between blended learning and hybrid learning? They seem similar. Yeah, they do. And maybe I didn't give a good explanation. <laughs> okay, so blended learning is a mix of some classes online and some face-to-face. -face. So the students, maybe the whole class, you know, comes, you know, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but on Tuesday and Thursday, they're online. It's something like that. With hybrid learning, some students are always at home. You might have half the class at home uh, and you might switch that from week to week, but there's always some students at home, always some students in the class. So it means you have to teach the students in front of you, but also think how are the students online learning as well. So it's a little bit more complicated. It divides the teacher's attention and it's, it's very, very challenging. Yeah, so. Okay. Next one here. I think this one might be uh, important for a lot of uh, teachers. How can we assess students' writing skills online? Students right. have thousands of ways to cheat in online tests. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, there are a number of, you know, different ways. The first one we have to really do is we have to personalize the information. So um, that at least stops them from copying their friends. So if I give an assignment and I say, okay, I want you to write about your family, then of course their family is different from everyone else's family. So 
that should that should make some differences. But the other case is uh, yes. In so by personalizing the things, that will help a lot. The other things people do, I know that there is something where uh, they they put the paper they put the paper underneath down here, like where my hand is, and they have to write by hand here, so the teacher can watch the screen in a Zoom class with everybody, and she can see everyone handwriting as they do it. Again, it's not perfect. The other, uh, you know, so basically it's very, very difficult to do. But uh, one of the things we've learned from research is that actually some skills are indicative of other skills, like listening skills. We can test listening and we've got a pretty good idea about how well students will read, write, speak and listen. It's just, it's just you know, decades of research into the area has shown that. So, you know, other tests will bring it out all together. Uh, so it's difficult. It's and and students are clever and they find many ways, many ways to plagiarize. But again, that's also because the students think that the test is more important than learning. So if you give them, if you if you really can motivate them and say, you have to learn, you have to write, you have to be able to do this on your own, um, and this is an important skill for you, then maybe it's less likely that they will cheat. But some students will always cheat, and it's just or or mom will write it for them or something like that. It's a challenge, yeah. I don't think there's a good answer yet, so. And we have one last one here we have time for. So how do teachers control buddies, buddies help together in learning English? I think this is the study buddies. Um, right. I tried to do it in my English class. So some students are willing to help others, but some students ignore. Thank you. Mark. Okay, okay, this is a good one, marks. <laughs> so first of all, yeah, you just, uh, you can shake them up. Uh, one thing to do is you don't have to have the same study buddies for the whole semester. You can change them every week if you want to. And that sort of means that if st two students really don't get along together, then of course, you know, then they can have a chance to work with somebody that maybe they like a little bit more. And it's kind of like a lottery. Some weeks you win, some weeks you don't. But, uh, but the other thing is to have marks for the study buddies helping the other ones. So if the study buddy is supposed to do certain tasks, say at the beginning of the class, say, okay, what should study buddies do? Ask your students. They'll tell you. They'll say, uh, I guess help the other students or, you know, do something else, uh, check their writing or something else. They'll get make a list of those things and then say, okay, I've got the list. I want each of you to do this. I'm going to do a check each time. And so, you know, at, at the end of the day or the end of the week, you say, okay, did you, as a study buddy, did you help do this, do this, do this? Okay, five marks for you. And uh, for those you didn't do this, mm, sorry, zero, zero, zero. Maybe that's motivating for some students or something. But, uh, but showing that, you know, having a clear idea about what they're supposed to do as a study buddy, making sure that they can really help each other, make it very, very clear, and sometimes just giving marks. So for peer editing, I mentioned this briefly, is that uh, if you give a writing assignment, uh, each student does it, uh, the study buddy has to look at their writing and uh, each other's. And then if the student gets a low mark, then the study buddy his, gets a small part of that. They also get a lower mark if they've you know, not been able to, not done their job helping someone else. So that's how it works. All right, thank you very much for answering our questions today. So I'm just going to do a quick wrap up for everyone. Um, so I had a lot of questions regarding the certificates and the slides and the presentation today. Uh, so like as we mentioned in the chat, uh, we will be uploading the webinar today to our YouTube channel. Um, and for more future information about webinars coming up and for other resources that uh, eFuture has been creating, uh, follow us on our uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram. We will be posting next month's uh, webinar schedule very soon. And today's presenter, Dr. Ken Beattie, will be doing another webinar for secondary learners. So for those teachers that attended today that also teach secondary, or you have teacher friends that also teach secondary, be sure to uh, let them know that we have a webinar for you guys coming up uh, very soon, next month, okay? And so um, for the webinars, for today's webinar, we do have, um, plan to upload it on our YouTube channel. So be sure uh, the link was uh, put into our chat. So be sure to follow us on YouTube as well. Uh, we have many different kinds of videos as well for you guys to kind of utilize. 
Um, there was a question about games and activities. Uh, we do also have game and activity videos as well prepared, so you can check those out. For certificates, um, there were some people that uh, had maybe not seen uh, where to contact to get certificates. Uh, these are the contact emails uh, for you guys. So if you have actually tried to contact, um, contact our uh, partners and haven't received a response, please let us know. Uh, contact us here at Inquiry at ELT Korea and uh, we will uh, kind of uh, get it situated for you. Uh, with all these webinars that we have, you know, we are trying to take in all the feedback that you guys have been giving us. So please fill out the survey um, and we will, you know, take all the suggestions for future webinars and, you know, any kinds of setups or, you know, uh, improvements that we can do moving forward. Uh, we will take that into account uh, for our future webinars. Uh, for those that asked about the presentation, uh, we do have that available. Um, if you keep a lookout, tomorrow Zoom will be sending you a follow-up email. Um, I will be putting a link in that email for downloading um, today's presentation and a PDF. So uh, Dr. Kambidi prepared the PDF for you guys, so uh, we will be making that available. So be sure to look out for that uh, email from Zoom tomorrow. All right. So thank you guys so much uh, for today. Uh, we have all the links in the chat for our social media and for our uh, our surveys. So if you guys can check those out, and we will be back next month. I believe uh, Dr. Kambidi will be the first webinar again next month, so you'll be seeing him again. I hope you guys enjoyed today, and uh, you'll join us again next month in a, actually a few weeks from now. So thank you, doctor, and uh, thank you, everyone, for taking your time out. We will see you guys at the next one. Thank you. Thanks so much.